Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our event this evening on applying to HDS at mid-career. It is so exciting to have you here, and we have an incredible panel of current students who all applied sort of mid-career, and we get a ton of questions about this, about how to navigate the application process, how to even get your feet wet back in academic settings. And so they're here to share their perspectives with you. And I highly, highly encourage you to use the Q&A feature to chat away your questions. Um, and so we also have a member from our Office of Career Services, our Associate Director, Mary Kiesling, who will be with us shortly, and she'll be helping to moderate today's event. So thank you again for tuning in. We're so excited to be here with you. My name is Alessandra Ludeking. I am the admissions officer at Harvard Divinity School, and I've been with HDS for about a year and a half now, and I was previously an admissions officer at Harvard Law School. So it's been about close to five years that I've been involved in the admissions world, uh, and I'm very happy again to be here with you all tonight. So what you can expect from today's event, I'm going to spend about the first 10 minutes sort of chatting through, providing you with a brief overview of Harvard Divinity School. And then the majority of the time will really be for our student panelists and our moderator, Mary Kiesling, so you can hear about our student perspectives and navigating HDS as a student mid-career. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off for this 10-minute presentation component. But again, please make sure to use the Q&A feature to chat away your questions. We're definitely going to reserve some time at the end for any questions that you may have for the student panelists or for Mary. The Office of Career Services has so many resources available to our current students as they discern their futures and, and their careers after HDS. So please do ask away. So as I mentioned, I'll turn my camera off for this portion and I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Okay, so the first thing to know about Harvard Divinity School is that we are the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world. This is the defining feature about HDS. We were founded in 1816, which makes us also the first non-sectarian divinity school in the United States. And essentially, our purpose is to educate our students both in the academic study of religion, as well as in the practical skills that they're going to need for leadership in various settings, whether that's religious, governmental, or a wide range of service organizations. So what does being the most religiously pluralistic school look like? Well, in terms of numbers, we have over 20 weekly gatherings um, we have more than 25 spiritual student organizations, but 45 student organizations as a whole. We have more than 45 religious traditions represented in our student body, more than 60 student-led special events that happen every year, and probably the most impressive number of all, we have more than 500 yearly recurring worship services, social gatherings, workshops, and group meetings. So there is always something to do at HDS. That's one thing to know about us. The second thing to know about HDS is that we have scholars and leaders who make a world of difference. Our academic offerings are challenging and rewarding. So HDS, for being a divinity school, is a big school. And being a big school means that we have big opportunities for you as well. HDS's Faculty of Divinity are among the most distinguished scholars of religion and practitioners of ministry in the world. As you can see on the slide, we have over 85 research professors visiting faculty, others offering instruction, um, and there are over 200 courses available to you as a student at HDS. But that number actually goes up if you take advantage of the cross-registration opportunities with the Harvard graduate schools, there are eight available to you. And if you take advantage of our partnership with the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, which opens up an additional 10 schools across Massachusetts. So really, you have more than 800 courses that are available to you in addition to 400 faculty. Harvard Divinity School also has 12 denominational counselors that offer support to our students who are pursuing formal ordination in a specific tradition. 
Um, and we have over 100 field education or internship opportunities if you are interested in pursuing the Master of Divinity. So these are sort of, again, a, a quick overview of the massive opportunities that we have here at HDS. Now, Harvard Divinity School offers four degree programs which lead to an infinite number of pathways. And I'll touch base with you on the four degree programs here really briefly. Uh, our Master of Theological Studies is the most popular degree here at Harvard Divinity School. It's a two-year full-time degree that enables our students to explore deeply and broadly the languages, the literatures, the thought, the institutions, the practices, the normative claims, and a whole structure of a variety of theological fields and religious traditions. So this is the broad study in religion, and you have one of 18 areas that you can focus in in particular. And we do have generous grant aid available for the MTS. In addition to the MTS, we offer the Master of Divinity or the MDiv. This is a three-year full-time degree and it's our second most popular degree option. And it's really for our 21st century spiritual leaders as we like to call them. Students in the MDiv learn the arts of ministry and we define ministry very broadly. It's very intentionally written with a lowercase m there because ministry is broadly conceived as including preaching, pastoral care, community organizing, any way in which you are utilizing your talents and your skills and your time for the purposes of service. And again, there is generous institutional grant aid available for the MDiv. The Master of Theology or the THM is a one-year full-time degree, and this is a bit more of a niche program intended for those who already have a Master of Divinity or a, an equivalent three-year theological degree and are just looking to pursue a new direction in their field of study. There is no grant aid available for this program, but we do have federal funding options available. And then finally, our newest degree program, the Master of Religion and Public Life, the MRPL, this will be our third year offering this degree. Um, and it enables experienced professionals who are looking to develop a deep understanding of the way that religion impacts their secular work. Um, so this is, this is a really great program for those who have a particular research question that they want to delve into for a limited amount of time. We don't, again, like the THM, have grant aid available, but there are federal funding options. Okay. The next thing to know about HDS is that we do have very comprehensive institutional grant aid for the MTS and the MDiv programs. At HDS, we have two pools of grant assistance. The first one is need-based, and this is where the majority of our financial resources are allocated. At Harvard Divinity School, we prioritize and we give our financial resources to those students who need it most. So, 90% of all applicants to the MTS and M MDiv degrees will receive some form of grant assistance. The bare minimum that we cover is three quarters tuition or 75% tuition. For those demonstrating more need, we all cover full tuition. And for those with most need, we cover full tuition plus a $12,000 living expense stipend. Need-based aid does require a separate financial aid application process. And this will, information about this will be given to you directly through the financial aid office if you ultimately submit an application to the MTS or MDiv. In addition to need-based aid, we do award a very, very small pool of merit aid, again, to MTS and MDiv candidates based on the overall strength of the application. Consideration is automatic, which means there is no separate application process for this. Um, and if you are awarded merit aid, you will be informed of this through your letter of admission directly. All merit awards will generally include a full tuition grant, so 100% coverage, with the addition of a modest stipend that will range anywhere from $12,000 to $20,000. <clears throat> and finally, last thing to know is the application process, of course, to our degree programs. Um, our application has been open now for about 
two months and it closes the first week of January. We don't operate on a rolling admissions basis. So please do feel free to submit your application on January 5th at 1159, if that's when you feel ready. Um, and we will extend interview invitations starting in late January, early February to a subset of the applicant pool. So not everyone will be invited to interview. And then all admissions decisions will be released in mid-March. I'm not going to go into too much detail right now about the application components, as we are offering a variety of virtual events still in the year um, in the form of Ask Me Anything with current students and with us, members of the admissions team. So you can ask about the various components as you are preparing your application. And if you do have any questions that we're not able to get to and that are admissions specific, please do feel free to email us or email a current student. Um, check out our blog and our Instagram. So that's sort of the brief overview that I wanted to provide you with, but you didn't come here to listen to me chat about um, admissions or HDS. You came here to learn about what it's like to apply as a mid-career professional. Uh, so at this time, I would like to invite our Associate Director, Mary Kiesling, and our wonderful panel of students, Keisha, Dana, James, uh, and David, if he's here, to go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Very happy to be here this evening. And um, so, as Alessandra said, I'm Mary Kiesling. I'm the Associate Director for Career Services. At Career Services, we really believe in the power of storytelling and believe that stories can really help us um, inform, shape, um, and kind of set our own direction for where we might wanna take our own path. Um, so we are really happy that our current students are going to be sharing their stories to help you as prospective students um, really think about the right choices for you. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and have the students introduce themselves and just say your name, program, and what you were doing before you came to HDS. And uh, we'll start with Keisha. Um, so we'll go Keisha, Dana, David, and James. All right. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, my name is Keisha, Keisha Bush. And what I was doing before HDS was one of the questions. Um, actually, I think I wrote it down for myself. I, I'm a novelist. So I have spent the last, I would say like 10 to 11 years um, writing um, full-time as much as possible. Um, and so my first book came out in 2021 and it's fiction, uh, but also to pay the bills, I was an adjunct or I still am adjunct teaching and um, teaching part-time. And I was also, uh, or, or I am still also <laughs> a freelance editor. Um, so I do structural edits for other fiction writers, memoirists, nonfiction writers, and I freelance as a copy editor. So I've always had multiple jobs as I was pursuing um, publishing, publishing my work. So, um, so it was, and then the other question is what made me come back to school um, you know we'll get to that next so we'll oh, just okay. do where you what you were doing before you came here we'll cover that one first okay Great. okay thank you thank you Great. so dana hi i'm dana hoey i'm a first year mdiv student um this is my dog um i i'm a uh, professional visual artist and art professor I was an art professor for 26 years, most recently at Bard College and before that at Columbia. I'm a photographer and I do live events as well. And uh, I'll tell you why I decided to come to school next, um, but that's my story. David. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. 
Sorry for being late. I'm between classes right now. Uh, David Holden, I'm a second year MDiv student. Very happy to be here. And I spent the last four years before coming here uh, running for Congress in Southwest Florida. And I'm not a member of Congress. And so I am a divinity student. <laughs> James. Hi, uh, James Lewis. I'm a third year MDiv student, and I spent the last 30 years as an attorney um, with the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps, specializing in contract litigation um, and leading uh, as the chief attorney um, teams doing um, contract administration, contract formation, also specializing a lot in criminal litigation and labor and employment litigation. Ten years ago, I was ordained as a minister in the Baptist tradition. I'm now a local licensed pastor in the United Methodist Church, currently on a path to ordination, but questioning whether that is, in fact, the right path for me. Great. Thank you, everybody. So why in the world would you decide to do a, a master's degree at this stage of your career? And we'll do, uh, actually, let's start with James, since you're already spotlighted. Um, I, I, I think it was um, uh, shoved in the direction of completing my religious studies. I began my studies uh, over a decade ago at a small um, uh, school of theology in, in Virginia, but then I was deployed uh, and, and for a year and then came back to a bunch of what we call high-speed, low-drag jobs, which meant no time to complete my religious studies. Um, but the last few years of my um, time as an attorney for the Army had me in some weird places, one, three years uh, doing legislative affairs. I spent most of my time on Capitol Hill um, seeing how the sausage is made. Uh, it was a bad process. Um, and my very last job was a detail in the executive office of the president doing, of all things, under the last administration, ethics. Again, terrible process. Um, and I recognize that I am Christian. I recognize that uh, many of my ilk either don't know what right looks like or they've forgotten or they just don't care. I'm also very concerned about the dismantling process that's been taking place uh, with respect to our, our, our democratic framework. And so I decided it was time to um, see if I could put uh, much better use to the skills, talents, training, experiences that, that I've been blessed to receive so that I can in a more um, um, definitive way, um, try to find other people, join them in leading a revolution of love in this country. Thank you. Dana. It's so cool, James. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. I was trying to make art um, be more political and ethical than the container would hold. Um, I, my tradition tells me that I need to do service. And so I was, I, I did make political art. I made feminist art. I made art. Um, I threw live events. I did self-defense classes at a museum. And, and I just tried to make art be more active in ministry than it um, really could hold. And so I want to um, still make art, but I want to be a hospital chaplain. And I just had a calling last Thanksgiving that's something I wanted to do 30 years ago. I wanted to go to divinity school 30 years ago and I went to art school instead. And so just, I feel really lucky and privileged to be at Harvard now to um, be able to come back to that dream. And and uh, yeah, I'm just feel really excited to be here. I will say that there are a lot of creative people at the divinity school. We see a lot of artists and musicians um, in in the community here, and it's it's a real presence at the school. Um, David. Sorry for the waving. I just saw a classmate I haven't seen in a while. Um, yeah, I <clears throat> my spiritual practice is centered in 12-step recovery, though my tradition, I was raised uh, in the Jewish faith tradition, and I spent 30 years before getting sober, which was 19 years ago, as an atheist, and I had a very unexpected, well, yeah, unexpected and powerful spiritual awakening uh, early on in my recovery, and so this was always kind of in the back of my head. I was brought into sobriety by a Unitarian minister on Cape Cod where I got sober. But I, I don't, <clears throat> I, prior to um, 
a while back, 12 years ago, I did a mid-career master's at the Kennedy School in Public Administration. And so I tried to bring spiritual principles into my campaigns for Congress uh, and did, in fact, do that. But I'm looking, I came here because I'm looking for a way to join uh, my spiritual practice and my interest in, in policy. And, and like James, I'm looking to bring, you know, love back into the world in a way that matters. And so I'm focused on how to be of maximum service to my fellows in whatever way I'm called to do that. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Um, I, what brought me back? Um, sort of what everyone has <laughs> has sort of inferred to uh, within their industries and and Donna within your within the arts space, right? Publishing, um, just it just really it doesn't support deep thinking. It doesn't support uh, work or writing that wants to engage on a deeper level. Um, and it's really it's really a space of privilege and fast money. Um, and so my first book that I worked on, um, I have an MFA in creative writing. So I did that at the new school and I graduated in 2015 and then sort of languished um, with my publisher. Um, but my first book is about a current human rights crisis in Senegal, West Africa, where I lived for four years. And um, Senegal is like 95% Muslim and it's a, a, a Islamic tradition that's being abused and the children are caught in this human rights crisis. And so although the book is a work of fiction, the house of the book itself is nonfiction. And I put fictional characters within. And, you know, I have, I, I, I went through just, uh, just a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but to just give you a bit of a snapshot, after a couple, after several years with Random House, the book is coming out. And then they bumped my book for Cuomo's uh, book, the one where he saved New York from the pandemic, supposedly. So just to give you sort of an idea, <laughs> like human rights crisis about children who are like in the midst of it at the moment. And Cuomo's like, I saved New York, you know, I'm a superstar. Um, like what is, what's chosen, you know, what, what, what is focused on. So I'm back in this space because my work is centered around people and religion, whether you're a believer or not believe, uh, unbeliever, or regardless of what your sort of space of belief sits, religion is very much a part of the world in which we live, um, politically, socially, culturally. And as a writer, um, I need I needed to do, I need to do more research. I need to dive in deeper into these different spaces um, to be able to tell stories that are truthful. But I also needed support, like personal support, because it's very difficult to be a person in the publishing space, um, writing what I'm writing, how I'm writing it. And I just don't come from a space of privilege, if that makes sense. So, yeah, and I love learning. Um, so <laughs> I am so happy right now. <laughs> oh, and I'm a first year MTS. So I just got here. <laughs> I think the love of learning is a common thread for sure. And we'll stick with Keisha. So um, what do you see as an advantage or um, some of the positive aspects of coming to this program with more life and professional experience? So my undergraduate degree is actually, I got it at Bentley, so it's in business. And, you know, like, I don't know, what were we, like 20, 21, 22, when we were graduating from undergrad? Um, 
Bentley University told us at the door, they're like, don't come back to graduate school until you go out into the world and get experience. They're like, you're going to come back to graduate school and make a fool of yourself if you are like 23 years old in a like, you know, MBA program, thinking that you can speak with everyone else in the class that has experience. So I waited already for my MFA. And so when I went into my MFA program, I was very focused about like what it was that I wanted. Um, and then it's so funny having my MFA has prepared me even more along with all this work experience that's, that's coming from behind it. Um, in terms of work, I went from uh, the, fi the financial services sector to the NGO sector, back to the NG like nonprofit sector here in the US and then teaching and stuff like that. So um, not only do you come in with, with the maturity to be able to engage with your community and engage with professors and the staff and deans and, and really have um, like adult conversations because you're bringing something, you're bringing a lot to the table. I mean, I'm blown away. Like, I don't even feel like I can hang with <laughs> my fellow classmates right now. <laughs> um, just like you all are like powerful and like, whoa. Um, and so you get, you, you have that. I think that's what makes HDS so rich is this diversity of people coming from different backgrounds in the, in the age ranges, like experience is dope. Um, and to have, and as an, as like, as an older, um, like student, you have language, you have a language that you can pull into your work um, in a way that if I was just coming out of undergrad, I, I would struggle with, I know I would. Um, so um, that's one of the things that I think is so amazing uh, is, is my own confidence in being able to approach the work, even though it's challenging. Great, great, James. Well, uh, Keisha just, uh, that was a home run. She pretty much hit everything. The the experience and the confidence that we have given the, um, you know, what we've done up to this point, uh, which leads to a certain level of maturity, also gives us the benefit of perspective. And when we are starting this second career, whatever it happens to be after uh, being at Harvard, um, that perspective will really come in come in handy. But it's coming in handy now um, because as we sit in these classes, um, you know, pouring over uh, readings that are amazingly um, uh, deep, um, the perspective that we bring to the classrooms, I think, as Keisha alluded to, enriches everyone. Um, we we come uh, to the to the discussions with perspectives that our uh, younger cohorts may not be able to um, to do. I mean, they have their perspectives, but I think there's a certain richness um, given the amount of things that we've done up to this point, and not just education, but just life experience. Nina. Yeah. Um. It you all have said such great things. I, I would just add that um, I'm not afraid of the workload at this age. I'm excited to do my work. Uh, I, I don't require a lot of hangout time the way that I did when I was younger. I go home, and I nerd out. I know that people can socialize more, but I, I'm just so excited to go home and do my reading. Um, I'm not afraid of getting grades. Uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I had the experience and the richness. I have found also that the young people at HDS appreciate that about me too. It's, uh, compare that to art school. It's not like that at art school. This is a different context where people really see your humanity and they appreciate what you have to offer. And it's, um, it's remarkable that way. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad I waited. I, I also, I too have an MFA from Yale in visual art. And um, I, I got that when I was 28, I'm 56 now. And uh I just feel like I've been waiting my whole life to be here. So I think my enthusiasm level is a little extreme. <laughs> it's very high. I'm very excited to be here. And that's uh, something that is as a result of my age. I'm aware of how fortunate I am to be here. David. 
Yeah, I mean, ditto what my <clears throat> classmates have all said. Uh, I love being an older student. I'm a little bit, it takes me longer to read and absorb than it used to, but it still penetrates. But what I bring in terms of my own experience and perspective, I think is a is a way for me to be of service to my younger classmates. We have a young student body here and uh, they've been through some stuff. You know, they have not had the same sort of opportunities or expectations that my generation has had. And I am, I believe the second oldest student here, I cling to that, uh, my older buddy, Frank. Um, but I'm also a different person than I was a year and a half ago when I came here. Uh, I have learned, I have, I have been welcomed into conversations and communities uh, that older white cisgendered men aren't often invited into. And I'm very grateful and humbled by that opportunity. And I also see the difference uh, between this David and the David that was here in 2008 at the Kennedy School. I'm taking a course there this semester called uh, Moral Practice for Public Leaders. And you know, on the one hand, it's like home cooking. Okay, I understand how this place works. Uh, but I also see the different perspective I bring as a divinity student to public policy and and ethical and moral conversations. Uh, and, and these are simply aspects of myself I didn't have access to 12 years ago. So it, it's very rich to be here. And it's, you know, both this beautiful little Pocket Campus and the larger Harvard community is such a resource that I call upon, you know, every day. Um, when I decided that I was going to run for Congress uh, in, at the end of 2016, I reached out to my community and my community responded immediately and like substantial nurturing ways to help me launch that effort. And if I can add one more word. Um, to this discussion, I would I would say resilience. We have been through a lot, <laughs> our younger cohorts certainly, but given the um, the challenges, uh, career and life challenges we've had, I think it makes certainly me feel a lot more resilient today than I would have been had I come here directly out of college. Um, so it's a benefit, it's a bonus to to uh, have the lived experiences that we do because of the resilience we are able to um, bring to bear. Okay. So lots of positives. Are there any challenges about being an older student in this community? Any particular order or? Yeah, we'll, we'll stay with you. Uh, well, yeah, um, I, I don't memorize as, as easily today as I as I was able to do way back in college. I had a class last semester, Hebrew Bible class, which requires a lot of memorization of dates and locations and people. And it it uh, it's doable. Um, I aced it, but it was not easy. I mean, I, I had to work really hard to do that. Also energy level, uh, you know, there there isn't as much um, uh, coal for me to, you know, toss into the burner. <laughs> <laughs> and days like uh, today, now that we have lost a lot of savings time, when the sun goes down, my body shuts down. <laughs> it's like it's time to go to bed. You know, I'm, I'm with I'm with Dana. I, I don't mind just kind of hanging out uh, by myself, and which isn't necessarily a good thing because my younger cohorts are, you know, they're inviting me to things, and I and I try to attend when I can. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of the other detriments, or not detriments, downsides, I think. Dana? When I go to the cafeteria uh, for the first week or two, I kept getting asked if I was a student. <laughs> That's hardly a painful downside, you know. Um, for sure, I was afraid of my brain not working as well as it used to. Um, and I haven't started a language class yet. I, um, I didn't pass the Spanish exam, although I can get by in person, but I was more rigorous than I expected. So I'm a little worried about the language acquisition. Everybody knows that's harder when you're older, but um, I do know how to work harder than I did when I was younger. So um, yeah, mostly just brain fears. Uh, I, I've i found in the first year you take um, 
a pretty theoretical class and I was uh, I found that that's been a good litmus test for how well my brain is working and it's it's a muscle like you get you get it's not a muscle it's your brain but it, it gets rolling and and I'm uh, they teach you how to learn too so like I'm relearning how to consume text and break them down so there, there's a lot of support for so my fears of not functioning as well academically seem to be unfounded. Tisha. Um, uh, unforeseen challenges. Um, so I have really worked myself into the ground. Um, like it's very difficult. Um, I have found it very difficult, even with like my MFA to find a full-time job and academia is not really, it's very difficult for Black people and Black women in particular to get like full-time positions or just my entire career has been very difficult. So I often, more often than not, am juggling multiple jobs. Like I had four jobs when the pandemic hit and I have three jobs now um, because Cambridge is kind of, ex came, I'm like kind of expensive. I come from New York, so like, <laughs> you know like it's it's kind of the same but new york was very expensive too so um so and that wasn't it wasn't my plan to have three jobs uh, <laughs> in four classes so i'm really juggling that but the maturity allows me to juggle that um but i have health issues that i that have really have become exacerbated over the pandemic so um, juggling health issues. And I also needed health insurance because when you're a gig worker, you don't have health, like good health insurance. So health insurance, yay. Dental insurance, yay. Here at HDS, you know, here at Harvard HDS, but I'm juggling health issues. But what I love about this community is, and the professors is just the understanding and the flexibility. Um, and, and so I'm able to do it. Um, but I would rather not have health issues. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it would make it easier. And one less job, at least one. <laughs> David. Yeah. Um, I am better at organizing my time and managing my energy, but I too, at a certain point, my brain's like, we're done. Uh, so I'm an early riser by nature, and that's been <clears throat> when I can do very intense uh, intellectual work. I'm, I'm fortunate to have my my wife with me, and that that was not the case for the first semester last year, and that just didn't work for us. Um, and we rearranged our lives so that we could be together, and some fortuitous things happen to allow that. Um, but part of my program, the MDiv program, is there are two field ed placements. So I'm been doing four courses and 15 hours a week uh, as a hospital chaplain intern. And that is, uh, I'm concerned about my ability to, to do all of that. So I too have, have some health stuff. The school has been very supportive of that, but I manage it very carefully. Um, I wear a mask at all times at school, in, in the classroom, just because of my age, I have asthma. And, uh, you know, I, I will be as careful as I have to be to, to protect my health. Because if I don't feel well, I'm, nothing's working up here. So, yeah, all that. Mary, I hate to be the alibi king, but David just reminded me of something very important. Um, he was the first to, to mention family. Um, I am not with my family. My wife uh, is is working full time in Northern Virginia. Um, I, we have four children together. Um, you know, one of them is is has left the home, but there are three remaining, and and that's part of my lifeline. That's part of my support system. That's part of, of um, my help. And be, not being with them is extremely difficult for me. Uh, I'm happy to say it's difficult for them, not happy because I like them uh, having difficulties, but because it's nice to be missed. Um, so I find myself going home quite regularly, and that's expensive, and there's disruption to, to studying, but it's, it's a balance. Um, when this program is over, um, I'm going to be rejoining my family, and I want my family to be whole. So 
Um, that's a challenge. Thank you all for your candor. Um, I'm going to shift to um, some practical questions that students, that prospective students have. Um, for someone who has been out of school for a while, something like having a writing sample is a little hard to get your mind around, like, well, what, what would you have written and how did, um, how did you approach the writing sample? Um, and um, let's um, actually, James, now that we have you on the screen, would you, would you like to address how you approach the writing sample? That's a difficult for me because I, I did a lot of writing in my in my uh, career, and and so I had a lot of recent examples. But I also had a fairly recent um, uh, master's degree from 2015, so all kinds of writing. So that, that was not a challenge in my particular case. David. Yeah, that was that was interesting for me. I had done a huge amount of writing uh, in the in the years leading up to <clears throat> applying to HDS, but you know, I reread some of this stuff and and I just put people into a coma because it was all you know political stuff and uh, it's put me in a coma. Uh, but I took a paper that I had written at the Kennedy School and I re I rewrote that, and that was actually in and of itself a really interesting kind of discernment tool that's a word you're going to be using a lot around here uh to to see where i was then and and the difference in my perspective on that case that i rewrote that so that's that's what i did uh, and that worked for me but you know i talked to a bunch of other students who <clears throat> who had to create something new for that sample and they found a variety of ways to do creative ways to do that and Dana, do you have anything to add in terms of um, advice or suggestions or drawing from your own experience um, that might be helpful? Um, I would just add that I did not write very much in my professional career. I would write press releases for shows, but I just wrote something. And then I showed it to my husband who pronounced it adequate. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I and then I obviously edited it a lot so um it can be done if you're not a writer it just takes um a lot of polishing yeah I um like James I was pretty lucky because I finished my MFA in 2015 and although it was fiction we had a fiction thesis um to whatever your genre was they also <laughs> made us, I don't want to say forced, or we were forced to do a nonfiction thesis also, um, a more academic paper. And I remember groaning about it, like, mm. and my advisor at the time said, well, you know, this will be very helpful um, if you decide to go back to graduate school or apply to PhD programs. So I had a 20 page academic paper um in comparative lit uh, which interestingly enough I like focused on some of the religious themes <laughs> in in one of those books so I went back to it um just like I think everyone else did and just sort of worked on it and polished it up um so very helpful thank you I uh, will stick with you Keisha so um, when you were trying to decide who to ask for recommendations for this program, how did you approach that? So I am very much about community. And when I was in my MFA program, um, I had, even before my MFA program, I had built a relationship with a professor in the program through like the continuing education classes, um, writing classes. And he and I had been working together for a couple of years. And then I entered the MFA program and built more relationships. So the director of my program of the MFA and this professor mentor, they have always been my um, uh, references for everything, you know, and, and, and it's, a, it's about relationship building. 
Like someone can write a reference for you if they know you, if they know your work. And so interestingly enough, um, when I told, I told a couple of people that I was applying and my editor at Random House offered to write me a reference, which was just very, very kind. Like I love her very much. Um, and yeah, so I, I felt very, very lucky. I think they said very nice things about me. So I'm like, thank you, everybody, whatever it is that you said. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, David. Sure. Um, I had, so one of my dearest friends was someone, when I was at the Kennedy School, he was a first year MDiv. And so he was very helpful in, in helping me make the decision to apply. And he was one of my uh, uh, recommenders. And I, you know, obviously that was helpful. Uh, and my other two were folks that knew me from a variety of different settings. So uh, somebody I had worked with in service in 12 step. Uh, and so folks that really knew me well and knew me deeply and weren't necessarily, I wasn't looking for uh, prestige. I was looking for people who really knew me and, and understood what I might have to offer the, the school. Okay, very helpful. We have an interesting question in the Q&A that um, I think would be really interesting to hear all of your perspectives on. Question is, what was it like to uproot from your home slash careers and actually move to a brand new location? What were the things that went, went into that? Um, David. Okay. Um, you know, I, after the end of my second campaign, uh, I had the opportunity to just reflect on that experience and to think about what the future might hold. And um, we had moved to Florida to be of support to family. And we had a little bit more leeway because another family member moved uh, closer. And we are both from New England and missed it very much. And I had such a rich experience at the Kennedy School and stayed very involved with the larger community that uh, it seemed like a natural thing to do, but it was difficult. And as I mentioned, uh, and as James mentioned, uh, it's been, it was very difficult for my wife and I to be apart. Uh, I found that a, a tremendous constraint on my ability to enjoy being here. Uh, but it, we feel very much that it was worthwhile for, for our family for us to do this. James, you touched on this a bit already, but what would you say to someone who has trepidation about about making this big disruption in their lives? Well, um, tongue in cheek, I'd say pray for COVID because the first year I was able to stay at home due to COVID. And so I was uh, still on active duty. I was retiring. Uh, I think I was uh, overlapped by three months, the time that I was in the program here and still working. I was a full-time pastor and I was a full-time caregiver for my adult special needs son. Um, so that was wonderful. But um, removing my tongue from my cheek, I, I'll say it, it's challenging anytime you enter a new environment and you're, you're, you're launching into something new and different. Um, if you can find an anchor here, if you know someone or if you can get to know someone, if you want to write to me, um, it's nice to know someone in the area that helps smooth the road a little bit. Um, when I came here, it was a shock to the senses. I don't like the cold. <laughs> and last year we had, if you remember, a blizzard <laughs> and, and the snow was ridiculously uh, deep. Um, transportation, uh, because I'm, I'm a little older, uh, getting around isn't as easy. Um, so I got a bike and that made things a lot better. Um, I, I think what will really help is to have a network of people that you trust, um, people that you can turn to, that you can communicate with, that you can you can be real with in expressing the challenges of, of being in this new environment at, at you know the time of life that we found ourselves in. Keisha, I see some affirm affirmative nods there. Would you like to jump in? 
I agree 100% um, with what James is saying. So when I announced like, hey, I got into Harvard, I'm so like, what just happened, right? Like that initial shock, I had people within my community from like my MFA program and um, other authors connect me with alumni of HDS and a second year, um, second year MDiv. And then, and so that helped a lot because we ended up having conversations along with the um, videos. Like, I think I watched everything that the admissions and financial aid office put out um, in terms of uh, videos and events. But I, so New York is, I was born in Boston, but New York is home. And I had zero intentions of ever moving back to Massachusetts period. My, my, my blood family is here. I was never moving back. And then during the pandemic, I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I wanted to exist from that space. Um, it was the centennial of the uh, Tulsa massacre. Um, and what ended up happening is I ended up getting comfortable in Tulsa, if that makes sense. It's really easy to get comfortable in those red states as wild as that, it's a, it's a different kind of comfort. It's not really comfortable, if that makes sense. Um, but life is easier and it's cheaper. And so when I was accepted, I actually couldn't afford to move back to the East Coast and I had to sell my car, which is something I actually did not want to do. Um, so there were big sacrifices for me, um, and major disruption, but it was absolutely worth it for me. And I wouldn't go back and undo it. I'd resell that car just as quickly as I did. Hearing a lot of courage here. Dana. Um, <clears throat> for me, um, both my kids had semi-launched. I, I too have a, um, adult kid that needs support, um, a mentally ill kid, seriously mentally ill kid. And so my life here feels, that's part of the reason why it's such an explosion of happiness to be here because I'm, um, uh, I have time to myself after a long time, not having time to myself. So, um, it's, it was definitely scary. I live three and a half hours from here in the Hudson Valley. It was definitely scary to what felt like separating from my husband, which I didn't separate from my husband. I'm, uh, he comes here every other weekend. And I go there every other weekend. Um, so yeah, that, that, the not being in the family is very strange. Um, they are, are they both boys are out of the house. Like I say, one, one in care. So I'm oddly, uh, free at the moment in that sense um so the transition was easier but i mean i'm in an apartment by myself i haven't been alone alone for uh, 20 years so there's uh, pleasure in that as well um so it, it's a serious thing and oh i will say there's an app I forget what it's called for incoming students it was super helpful for me and i didn't know anybody the art world is not leading to divinity school at all and in fact, people do not understand it at all because it's it's generally extremely secular. And so I didn't know anybody. So Harvard provided an app that to allow us to connect to other students. So that's that's been very helpful for me. Let me can I piggyback off something you said, Dana? The, coming to HDS has to be a family decision. If you have a significant other, I, I would strongly recommend that the two of you agree that this is the place for you because there'll be times when you question. And then they, they question, why are you here? And it, it is important that you would have already had that conversation and reached an agreement. In my case, Harvard was my wife's idea. I, I planned on being at a, a divinity school or theology school in Washington, DC. Um, but I, because I was homeless at the time, um, I, this is years and years ago, I didn't take an opportunity that was uh, afforded me to come to Harvard College. And my wife knew about that. And so it was her idea. We talked about it, prayed about it, and decided this was the right thing to do. And that helps for those dark times, those those rough times when they're saying, I miss you so much. They don't add, and why are you there again? Because you've already had that discussion and agreement. And I'd like to add, um, it's Slack, Dana, right? 
Exactly. They connect the entire incoming class on Slack and the conversations, the introductions and the support is real in that space. And this happens over the summer. Well, thank you, all of you, for your candor. David had to go to class. Um, this is a very busy time of year for our students, so we're especially grateful for the time that you made um, and the uh, authenticity you shared. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Alessandra, I will turn it back to you, and um, um, I will turn it back to you, Alessandra. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dana, Keisha, and David, who had to jump off to class. But you all are such rock stars. Thank you so much for the authenticity of your responses, for really sharing, you know, both the joys, the positivity, and also the challenges of being a mid-career applicant. Um, I know you just got over midterm season, so you've made it through a substantial part of, of the semester already, but thank you again for your time. And uh, for those of us who tuned into the event tonight, we hope that it was helpful to you. Again, if you do have any particular questions, please email us in admissions and we can try to connect you to folks who may share a similar experience to what you're going through. So again, thank you all so, so, so much. Enjoy the rest of your day, your week. Happy holidays. I know we're heading into the holiday season too. And um, you're incredible. So I'll go ahead and close the event now. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Yeah.